grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. In the early 60s, my parents bought the house that I grew up in for at least the first 13 years of my life for the grand sum of $10,500. Can you imagine that, a whole house? I mean, you can't even buy, you can hardly buy a decent used car for that. Their mortgage payment was a whopping $100 a month. And when I was in eighth grade, the year I was confirmed, that was 1974, we moved to a different house for the astronomical price of $23,750. Their mortgage payment skyrocketed, doubled to $200 a month. And I remember my mom just wringing her hands and thinking, how will we ever afford such extravagance? Now, I'm telling you this in order to kind of set the stage for why we moved. When we moved into the first house, it was a big old white house uh, with an upstairs, and it had been built in 1920. It looked good. My mom always wanted a big old two-story house, and uh, so things looked good. They bought it for $10,500. We moved in, and then, you know, reality sets in uh, once you actually live in a place for a while, and the thing we discovered was that the house was slowly sliding off its crumbling foundation. We couldn't afford to shore it up. We didn't have the resources, and so we moved. Two sides to every story. What goes up must what? Come down, right? What looks spit-polished and shined on the outside might well reveal a huge mess on the inside, especially if it's on a false or faulty foundation. Think about the Pharisees. What does Jesus call them? Whitewashed tombs, looking so good on the outside, but crumbling on the inside because they don't have a proper foundation to stand on. Two-faced two sides. Well, the master, teacher, savior, Jesus, comes to us today in our gospel, teaching as he does so often with a parable, a parable of the tenants today in which there are clearly two sides. On the one hand, it's a severe pronouncement of God's judgment upon the house of Israel and especially upon its religious leaders for their rebellion and rejection of God's grace. But we're clearly told Jesus also speaks this parable to others, verse 16 of the gospel. Others, who are they? The new Israel. In other words, the holy Christian church. Well, the one side of the parable of the tenants reveals what we call God's alien or foreign work, his judgment upon those who reject or refuse his grace. The parable does quite a good job of summarizing Israel's wicked response to God's patient dealings with them. Jesus compares God's chosen people to tenant farmers. And in this gracious covenant relationship, God designed that Israel would bring forth the fruits of faith. But the old Adam tenant farmers chose to keep the fruits, and to seize the vineyard for themselves, even though the one true owner patiently sent servants or prophets to remind them again and again of his grace and of their responsibility. And finally, in the ultimate act of love, the owner sent his son who, as we know, was rejected and even killed 
outside the vineyard. And the result is clear. The owner of the vineyard would destroy the rebellious tenants and would give the vineyard to others. There's that word, others, again. Now, when I read through this, I had to stop and look in the mirror a bit and ask myself the question that I will pose to you, how often don't we act like the wicked tenants by the way we respond or even fail to respond to God's gracious dealings with us? We ignore his call to us in word and worship. Faith's fruit is all too often scarce in our lives or sometimes even hidden in our lives. We act as if we were the owner or the Lord of the vineyard, arrogantly laying claim to what has been entrusted to us by the owner, by God. As if they were somehow our own achievements, the things that we dredged up within ourselves. This is my life. This is my time. These are my possessions. These are my resources. Martin Luther was blessed with a beloved wife and helpmeet, Katharina von Bora, whom he affectionately called Kitty. Kitty, my rib. Eve was taken from Adam's side, and he loved Katarina so much that he called her Kitty, my rib, taken from my side. Well, I also want you to know something. The Lord has blessed me with the most wonderful rib, Joanne, whom over these 36 years of our marriage I have affectionately referred to as Joey, my rib. I call her Joey at home. And she has been an absolute rock for me over these 36 years, and especially during this really trying time with my health. I received the most amazing card in the mail this last week. Just blew me away. It says, walk by faith, not by sight. That's from 2 Corinthians 5, 7. I opened it up, and it's full of personal messages from the Friday morning men's Bible study of Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Lakewood, Colorado. I thought, how did they even know about me? Very, you know, it's not even just signed names, but very personal, loving, prayerful messages. And I was remarking to Joey, my rib, about how special it was that they would do something like that for somebody that they don't even know. And she texted me this devotional thought I want to share with you. It's based on John 13, 34, as I have loved you, so you must love one another, Jesus' words. And the devotion says, our small congregation decided to surprise my son for his sixth birthday. The members of the church decorated his Sunday school classroom with balloons and set up a table with a cake on it. When my son opened the door, everyone shouted, happy birthday. And later on, as I was cutting the cake, my son came over to me and whispered into my ear, mom, why does everybody here love me? I had the same question. These people had known us for only six months, but were treating us like longtime friends. Their love for my son reflected God's love for us. We can't understand why he loves us, but he does, and that love is freely given. We've done nothing to deserve his love, and yet he lavishly loves us. Scripture tells us God is love. It's a part of who he is. God has poured out his love on us so that we can show that same love toward others. Jesus told his disciples, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. 
By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The people in our small church community love us because God's love is in them. It shines through and identifies them as believers in Jesus. We can't comprehend God's love fully, but we can pour it out on others, being examples of his unexplainable love. And then Joey, my rib, texted me, this is the explanation for the love of those people. And I can tell you in two words just exactly how I felt. Humbled and blessed. The early Christians were characterized by the unbelieving world in this way. See how much they love each other. See how much they love. And I can't help but ask the question, I wonder if the world particularly the unbelieving world, sees the church that way today. And if not, then I have to ask, why not? Well, you and I both know the answer to that why not. It's because the devil beckons and the old Adam pulls. There is this battle going on between the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, and we are tempted to turn inward and to get all bogged down by our problems and our trials, or sometimes even to just kind of throw up our hands and say, well, why even try? But it's through the cross now think about that. Look at, look, at, look at a cross. Look at the cross in that stained glass window or on top of the, the altar piece. Cross, the cross piece. Look through the cross and see the other side of judgment. The parable of the tenants not only tells us about God's foreign or alien work of judgment, but especially shows us God's native work or his proper work, what he has done for us, what he makes possible through his mercy and grace in Jesus Christ, most especially and most appropriately revealed to us in the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus refers to his own death in this parable by which he incurred God's full wrath against our sin. He took the hit for what we by our sins deserved. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we in turn might in him become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5. Today's gospel finds us of all places in Jerusalem on Tuesday of Holy Week. And the throng around Jesus is becoming increasingly polarized as our Lord moves on toward his mission to save the world by his cross. And he quotes Psalm 118, verse 22, in verse 17 of the Gospel text, when he says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone, pointing to his resurrection and the establishment of the new Israel, his holy Christian church. And with that very same psalm, Psalm 118, the crowd greeted Jesus at his triumphal entry into Jerusalem just two days before that. And although rejected, even killed, Outside the vineyard, Jesus the stone, Jesus the capstone, Jesus the cornerstone, sets the foundation for everything in our lives. 
The Greek word for stone there, the capstone or the cornerstone, it can be translated different ways. It's so rich in meaning. It can have several different meanings. It can be the large stone over a doorway, sometimes called the lintel. And a lintel kind of bridges a, a large opening and bears the weight for it. It also can refer to that stone above an arch. And check this out architecturally sometimes. You'll see an arch often with this kind of a wedge-shaped stone in the very middle of it. I always thought it was more or less decorative. It's not at all. It serves a very important purpose. That is called the capstone. And without that capstone in place, exerting this kind of pressure that actually keeps the arch up, the arch could never stand. It also could refer, that word stone in our text, could also refer to that very important cornerstone upon which the building effectively rests and from which gets its bearings and its straightness. And that's the point of this whole thing, that Jesus is the essential foundation of our lives. There's no substitute for Jesus and his word. He is the word made flesh, but if you want to build your life on something, this is the foundation to build on. And I promise you, it's not going to slide off that foundation like my old house did. The Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. Jesus himself said, without me, you can do nothing. He is the source. He is the foundation. He is the cornerstone of our faith. He gives us new life. He blesses us with fruitful labor in his vineyard. And those who know him by grace who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, are enabled by him, empowered by him, to be good tenants in his service, in his vineyard. A good tenant or a good vine dresser, that's another word for tenant that can be translated, is the opposite of the wicked tenants in Jesus' parable. The good tenant is humble, knows his or her own sin and knows his or her own redeemer. They're humbly aware of God's ownership of everything and of his wonderful grace toward them that moves their hearts to serve and to return with thanksgiving and praise. They are open, they are receptive to and humbly obedient to his word, clinging to his son Jesus by faith, and then bursting forth and bearing fruit because they just can't hold it back. They can't help. And it's not because it's something they're doing, but rather it's engendered in them by the Holy Spirit who lives in them, and they just bear that fruit to the glory of God. That's why being a part of the church is such a blessing from God. We get to love. We are blessed to serve. And let me tell you, we are blessed to serve the Lord at Trinity Lutheran Church and School. Our congregation and school were founded in 1884. That's phenomenal. You should have seen the kids' eyes at chapel one day. I think it was National Lutheran Schools Week, and I told them, you know, 240 kids sitting out here, I told them, this school's been around for 135 years, and you should have seen their big old eyes. It was like, 135 years is a long time. It's a long time to an old guy, much less to a six-year-old sitting there in the pew. 135 years of struggles and joys of sorrows and blessings, 135 years of the privilege, the, the mission opportunities of sharing the life-giving and saving gospel of Jesus Christ, 
to extend the kingdom, to teach children of all ages to meet the needs of the community around us. And through it all, God has kept this congregation together, faithful, anchored on the foundation, anchored in his word and the sacraments as he blesses us and feeds us on our pilgrim way. Why? Because we are, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. So I want to give you a shot in the arm today and encourage you, no matter how bad things ever seem to be in your life, or even in the life of the church, in this veil of tears that we live in, Christ is the solid rock upon which God builds his church. And though the devil might try his worst, he promises us that the gates of hell will not overpower it. We need that foundation in our lives. We need that foundation in our church. We need that foundation in our daily spiritual life with our Lord. Our faith is a substantial building built by God's design, which needs a firm foundation upon which we can stand through this life to life eternal. Because this life will bring all kinds of things. Tragedy, loss, heartache, sadness, difficulty, trial. And all these things may shake us up big time. But I want to tell you one thing. Jesus Christ will never be shaken. He is with us always to the very end. And he promises us all sorts of things in this foundational book, like I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'm with you always to the very end. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Through all the ups and the downs of this life, know that no matter what comes your way, you can receive Christ as he is, King of kings and Lord of lords, Savior, Redeemer of the most hopeless situation. The most hopeless situation is my sin that separated me from him. He is life's most essential foundation for living in this world and especially the world to come. So think of it this way, with Christ as our cornerstone, capstone, the rock upon which we build, no matter what bad news comes our way in this life, we don't ever have to fear the other side of judgment. We are in Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.